Welcome world and everybody to the next OSC developer meeting June 27. I'm recording this for anyone who misses it. So let's get right into the program. So there's a working document for today. Let me paste that into the, the working, working window. There you go. Okay. There's the working document for today. So we can follow that and let's get busy with it. So welcome everybody. Uh, welcome. We have one new player on the team. So welcome to Christian Rupp from G Germany. Uh, new player on the team. This is the, the agenda that we're following for today. The numbers, team numbers, we're kind of, as you see the numbers, we, we keep track of what everyone's doing. And we're, we're having about six people log. So some people are not logging and kind of dropped to about like 10, uh, about a hundred, a little over a hundred hours per week total combined effort by all the players. So that shows the hours divided by 10 in the red and the number of players is six. I mean, we have actually like, like 18 or so people on the overall team. So there's some people that are missing in action here, but let's review what the progress is from the days before. Uh, from the week before. So basically what we'll do today is progress report. Um, not this, not file simplification process. Progress report essentially and, and work allocation. So let's let's get right into it and let's see who we have on the team here. We have Dixon, Joseph, Will, Jose. All right. Um, okay, so let's go through through the developments that have happened this week uh, let me share my screen as well so everyone can can see it as well um, okay so here we go so going through the working document there, the progress has been, a few good points have happened uh, across the 3D printer, across the CNC torch table and a circuit mill and the filament extruder. So we're working on a lot of things here, all based on the, the modular construction set for CNC machines. So one nice item that came into play here is this simplified frame for the 3D printer. Uh, to emphasize that. So what you see here instead of the standard steel frame is a frame made out of PVC and 3D printed corners. So you can go to IO's log. Uh, go, you can go to that on the wiki. But the simple idea is that instead of using steel cut by a CNC shop, we can 3D print the corner brackets, uh, these things here and then use standard PVC that's off the shelf. So that's a good idea for a very low cost frame. If you can get access to 3D printing, the PVC is only be like, only gonna be like say three quarter inch PVC, It'll only be like a few bucks for the entire frame. That's, that's really nice. So we, I can actually start trying to print out these corners and see how this works. So that's a definite point to prototype. Um, height controller, Oliver is doing epic work on a height controller one is that the actual board that he designed came in so he's going to actually build it for the capacitive height sensor for the cnc torch table which means that the torch head is following the surface of the metal very closely now as a backup to that because we are going to cut our steel for this this um, upcoming brick press production run brick press and power cubes we're going to build that with our torch table so we we have a backup of a manually controlled uh, height adjustment using uh, another little circuit that Oliver has came up with so you can go to Oliver log to see that but basically a knob where you turn turn it to move the head up and down so that's that's good as a backup as we're working on the, on the automated height controller for the CNC torch table we are also working on a, just a simple manual version. If we skip all the way to slide number five, this is the progress on a CNC torch table, actual structure. So what is what is this? 
that is essentially an XY gantry. This is uh, this is by Israel. So Israel's done good work on basically translating our design system to a much larger five by ten foot structure. So what you see there, so so Israel log, what you're seeing here actually one inch axis members. This is not no longer the eight millimeter. This is more like twenty five millimeter rods here which are going to carry the torch for the torch table on a much, much larger structure. So this is huge here. But we're still using the, our ti very tiny stepper motors, which can be sufficient, and exploring the larger stepper controller for that. And what we're going to do right now with this is mount this on our, our existing CNC torch table that we have at, at Factory Farm. And that's why we have these angles that are simply going to mount to an existing table, which is a water table on which the steel sits it's it's got a water bath on the bottom so it doesn't heat up and bend as you're cutting so that's that's great progress there uh, excellent work and we're gonna work on a mount to to attach the z-axis here so the torch head moves up and down now here what we'll be using is simple oxyacetylene since that's already in the, the infrastructure that we have so you don't need a plasma cutter you can do it what with oxyacetylene to get nice cuts uh, using a simple system. Okay, so that's the CNC torch table progress. Excellent work. Um, moving on. So here at Factory Farm, I've got the the single D3D printer printing parts for more 3D printers. So I've been pretty much running the machine 24-7. The prints are perfect. It's just excellent. Uh, the bed leveling, as you see, you pretty much lay, sense the bed surface using that little sensor there. Uh, there's a yeah, if I zoom in on that a little bit, actually let me zoom in on that there, but by the print head, that's, see that's the print head there, the sensor is right there, and it senses the height of the, the aluminum bed, and then it follows, it's very, very close, it's about a millimeter off the, of the top as the print head uh, does the printing, but you see like the first layer here, all the time it just, just gets it right on, and we have to adjust it up and down just a little bit, and then once you set it, it pretty much goes. So that's really good. Um, good progress on that in-house here as in proving out that the machine is working and exploring how many failed prints I get. So if I've, I've been keeping track, I guess I did about... Uh, this print here, for example, is about uh, maybe five hour print to, to get nine of those, um, eight of those 3D printed pieces. What you see here, this blue 3D printed piece is the same as the blue one back there, or not, not exactly that one, but we're printing the 3D printed pieces of the next machine. Um, I'm running about eight hour long prints, and that's going very well. I'm using, like pretty much here you see half the bed being taken up. I could, just now I did double this for a nine hour print for the short idler piece. And uh, so that's a nine hour piece filling up the whole bed. So that's that's pretty good. Moving right along and then I could do things like, for example, print out the corners. But I want in the next few days maybe build out, uh, I, I printed out enough parts for about four more 3D printers. So I'll, I'll uh, assemble those together here. Now at the same time that we're going with the 3D printing, so Shane from Michigan Tech University is here and we're building the the cnc circuit mill so that's what it is you got you got the same axis frame same axis and frame our 3d printed pieces and uh, a spindle mount so this i designed uh, in freecad mounted it to the the regular axes and um that's what we have right now we haven't put it together because we're actually working on a open source power monitoring system for our uh, off-grid house here but here what you see is using a dial indicator you can move the axis and see the motion down to one thousandth of an inch or so so we're basically getting very precise measurements here of the motion and yes it is it's it's pretty good like say you move um, when we were doing initial tests when you move say 0.1 of an inch you can see the replicable motion down to one thousandth of an inch at plus minus plus minus one half of a one thousandth of an inch right now so it's pretty precise so we're looking forward to definitely uh, doing some CNC circuit milling 
you can look at the Facebook link there to see some of the initial uh, we put a pen in uh, instead of a spindle to show how the, the thing moves and so forth so you can look at the wiki page you can see the video of the CAD design and that's by Will so thank you Will that's that's being built and working excellent so far um, what else have we got um, one major piece of update here as you can see this video if you go into video view mode this is language agnostic instructionals video by Roberto uh, excellent work a nice long detailed video about how do we extract nice isometric views from FreeCAD and how do we end up getting language agnostic instructionals basically just like IKEA style fabrication diagrams build diagrams that don't use any language but it's all symbolic and you have different arrows and things uh, so we'll be doing that thank you Roberta for doing that that's great work great video um, you can take a look at that others can take a look at that but what we'll do is uh, once we're ready for this and get everybody aligned on doing some set of instructions we can all follow this video and pretty much um, do it in parallel so who else have I missed as far as important updates here um, anything else as far as Dixon we are working on the uh, as far as the filament extruder for making 3d printing filament and uh, do you want to maybe report on that briefly here Yep. All right, there's that lines, um, I guess, my findings. And so the, the filament extruder file that you get from Thingiverse, I thought had a bunch of parts that were um, optional variations, but it looks like that he included one of his past versions. Um, and so what I've done in this a Google Slides document is I've made a list of the printed parts of what appears to me to be his newest version. Uh huh. Um, and the only optional things really are the auger and motor extruder case can be printed in one large part. It can be printed in two parts, and then even further than that, the uh, the auger casing, the hopper half, can can then also be printed in two parts. Um, and he mentions in the construction manual that this is to compensate for for warp, but if the specifications of the printer you're using are bigger, uh, then you can print that all in one go. And there's um, mesh files also to print the entire big box case in one print. Um, but I don't really know. I'm not experienced enough with 3D printing, and I don't know um, what the capabilities of the D3D are to know which would be the ideal to do yeah um, but if yeah. you look on slide three there's a list of all 21 um, plus or minus one depending on what parts you decide to use uh, parts to print the extruder because um, I know you had mentioned that you wanted to you wanted to get that done so that yeah. list um, is the newer case the spooler, um, it looks fine. There's no redundancy or anything there. So all of those parts can be printed and experimented with um, and then traced. Um, I'm thinking the, the, the other case style could have some benefit. I don't, I don't see it. So um, unless someone else has uh, a perspective on why that might be the superior way to build the case, the other version is like a slot assembly and has a couple other minor differences whereas this other one is smooth edges that you just epoxy together yeah um, yeah so that's where I'm, I'm 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 sure on what uh, assuming that this is the case design that we want to go with I'm now sure about the exact list of files that need to be traced um, and that should be printed so that's that's about where I'm at this week okay that's good. And as far as these part names, are they in reference to the names that you've already uploaded to the wiki? Uh, yeah, those are those are the part, uh, the file names.
kinds of VSTLs that uh, you could get from the download file or from the part library. I haven't changed the names of VSTLs. Yep, and the Lyman Film and Extruder Part Library, that's the wiki page um, right there where we have, so that's the filament extruder and we've got all the different files so we can pick them from there so so the limit is basically the 8 by 8 inch surface of D3D right now I'm assuming that thing is I mean that thing definitely looks bigger as far as um, the picture here it's it's it looks like we probably want to print it in quarters I mean this is probably um, I don't know what the exact dimensions are but that looks more than 8 by 8 inches definitely so probably printed yeah. like here where I could see these squares um, basically the base broken down into four parts and so forth so yeah yeah that's good uh, has Abe been active on on some of that as well Did we, let's see what we got on um, Abe um, I actually haven't checked his log and I haven't managed to communicate with him directly this week I've been uh, I was busy during the week last week yeah. But let's have a look at his log. Yeah, so. Um, not seeing clear. Yep. Okay. Um, that sounds good. That's, that's pretty good. So let's think about the next steps on that. Okay. Um, more updates. So we've got Jose. Do you have um, an update to share? Well, I are you are you trying to speak or? Can you listen to me now? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Yeah, I tried different uh, things in WordPress because. Uh, but there was one that uh, that uh, was geo directory that was very promising uh, because it allows you to map uh, to use geolocation to map uh, people and uh, events and stuff like that. But I, you cannot test it in your local host. Uh, and then I had to go back again and, and try to make a very simple uh, theme. So yeah, you have to. It's not. It's not yet ready. Okay. Okay. Um, is there any? Um, let's see. Is there anything you can show or not yet? Actually, yeah, as far as yeah, I can show you what I'm trying to do. Let me show you yeah. Uh, let me show my local yeah. Show you what I showed you. Basically, the thing is that uh, show my screen. And you see my screen now? Um, no. Cannot yet, not yet. Yeah, there we go. Well, yeah. So the, the last thing I was trying to do was to uh, use a simpler thing, uh, and uh, but I was also importing some libraries uh, of Semantic UI and uh, Bootstrap to have more flexibility in presenting content uh, because I had the uh, first. Let me show you. Yeah. No. That looks... had... Mm-hmm. Was uh, this one, but it was a, a, a very, let's 
say kind of uh, difficult to customize because these, these are really nice stuff for if you don't want to customize too much just changing colors and changing images something goes wrong with the logo here but uh, this, this was the old one Uh, I don't know what's going on. And then I, well, basically, you see, I'm trying to uh, just make uh, make it the, the, the other way as it is here now. And, and then the idea is that here we would have the, the post uh, events. Uh, but that's something we should arrange. Like, what, how do you want to do it? Because with event right, you can start doing it already. The point uh, is now to get going with the workshop, right? Yeah. Um, so with event, yeah. Right. So let's see. When when can we meet to um, maybe go over some of this last stuff of how to maybe replicate what you I don't know. Uh, is this ready? Like as you work on this, can we update? Like say you you still do some changes to it. If we install it just to see how it looks for now. Uh, can we up, update it very easily, uh, like while you're still yeah, working on it? It will be just uh, copying the the files of the team. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if I work with someone that is uh, on the side of the server, we could. I'm I'm actually documenting this in in, uh, in GitHub. So everything I do and change is there, even with my comments on the code I change and everything. Uh huh. But it, it it's basically theoretically it's basically copying the the files and just putting it in, in the in a, in a folder in the in, in the server and creating the database and everything that you already have, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So we we may want to look at. Um, so Michael, we've got Michael Altfield who's working on the back end of the server. Maybe we should meet together. Um, when would you be available? Uh, well, I, I think uh, well Thursday I'm, I'm I'm free. Okay, maybe. So, yeah, Friday also we can meet. Uh, so that's fine. Friday. Okay, let's try to see if we can go Thursday, like maybe same time, like 1 p.m. or something. Yeah, can for me, it's a, it's a, if you can make it at 11, it's great, great because now... It's 11? Really okay. Whatever is, it's better. Okay, so 11 a.m. on Thursday, let's let's try to shoot for that. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, excellent. Um, yeah, that's good, that's good. Um, very nice. So, let's see... Thank you, Jose. Then, so yeah, we'll, we'll continue on that. And uh, I just wanted to sh to show off. Um, this is the latest from Will in terms of the route, the CNC circuit mill here. So what we're doing is, and this is what we're building right now in a shop. You can look at uh, Face OSC Workshops Facebook page. To, um, to see what it is, but it's our access system, and then we've got a metal plate and this 3D printed holder for the, the little PCB board. And the way it works, there's actually some good open source software there that lets you do, um, like when we, let's see, can somebody, let's see, we gotta mute somebody there. Let's see, is that good now? Yeah. Um, Likewise, this has a probing mechanism where, where what happens here, if, this, if you've got a circuit board in here, you probe the bed to see how to get it flat, because you really have to follow the surface of the board very, very tightly as well. So you, you dip it down to the surface with, the, with your drilling or milling bit, and you basically map all the points for the height. So that's how it works, and there's code for that that you can use so yeah this is the latest from will so will thank you that's that's good that's exactly what we're building here and we're aiming to have that by the end of the week actually milling some circuits here uh so that's good let's see maybe one one more thing um yeah a couple more things uh 
Roberto, can you can you talk to us any more about um, the language agnostic instructionals? That's that's all ready to go, or do you have any further comments or work to do on that? Um, if you want to type in or let us know. Okay, so we're pretty good. Yeah, we're pretty good on a language agnostic instruction. For the people who joined a little late here, look at the recording of this regarding the language agnostic instructionals and um, make sure you have the, once again, the link for the new people uh, for today's working document. Um, okay, that's pretty good. Um, more reports. So let's see, let's hear a little bit from Oliver maybe uh, while we're at it. Uh, Oliver, can you fill us in on the latest on the height control on, on the torch table? No, we can't hear you. Not yet. Maybe you want to try to log in and log out. Yeah. Yeah, you might have to log out. Um, and anything else? Um, I.O. as far as the the simplified version of the frame, that's ready for printing. So that's good. Yeah, we still cannot hear you there, however. Oliver, if you're trying to speak, can't hear you. Maybe try again. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah. Ah, uh, I've forgotten to plug in the USB <laughs> stick of the camera. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah, um, where should I start? Uh, the manual um, uh, torch table height controller. Um, as you may have seen in my log, I've worked further on that and um, I have uh, made a, a turning knob, a job wheel yep. uh, from 3D printed and that works well and gives, gives, gives a better handling mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as I have assumed and yeah, so far this thing is good. Then um, the I have made um, a project page on the wiki, oh, nice. which, yeah, which I have, when when doing this, I have had in mind that this should be enable you to um, re um, re engineer the, the 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 project that you can do such a thing on your side. Yeah. 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 So you are now my guinea pig for testing how good my documentation was. If Excellent. Everything is, <laughs> well, I hope that it would be, then you should be able to, um, to, to, to build that. And if not, then of course uh, uh, I can help you if, if anything is unclear or whatever. But theoretically this should be sufficient. Yeah, that's so, excellent. So we've got the full full replicability instructions for how to do the manual version of the CNC torch table height controller right there which is great yeah. and I can I can pretty much um, get those parts and implement that I already have printed out the large some of the large one inch rod version of the CNC torch table so I can pretty much put a sample of this axis together like in this picture um, and then actually start testing the I mean, I can start testing the Z, I mean, of course, your your part, and then just the XY motion as well. So that's, yeah, it takes, uh, but it takes about, um, when you print the carriage piece for the CNC torch table, one of those pieces currently with a 0.5 nozzle uh, takes five hours. So uh, that's it's quite a bit. So each axis here, like if each axis, we've got like one, two, three sets of axes, um it's five hours for this the carriage piece but then it's only like an hour or two it's like more like two hours for the other pieces because they are smaller but each but that's for a clamshell that's not for the two pieces it's just for one of the clams so 
we're seeing that one axis is going to be 20, 22, 24, 26, 28 hours for one of them, and we have four of them total. So essentially four full days of 3D printing to get the, the these much larger 3D printed pieces, um, which is acceptable. But then I actually tried a 0.8 millimeter nozzle, which doubles the speed. It, it, that did it in about, that took it down to about two hours from five hours. But you got to worry about all the settings. Like you probably have to have a fan. Like the, the 0.8 nozzle wasn't working. It was getting droopy on me. But if we figure out the larger nozzle sizes, we can print that much faster. So we probably, uh, I will work on maybe getting the larger nozzle sizes to print now the larger CNC torch table pieces. So that's that. Yep. Um, so you're moving right along. You got the, the the PCB boards for the the automatic version, sensing version. Um, did you start working yeah, on yes. that yet? Yeah, they have uh, arrived recently, and they looks nice, as you can see on the pictures uh, of the lock. Yep. And uh, now I have nearly all parts uh, completely. I'm still awaiting the AD7747. And uh, yeah, I hope it will arrive maybe tomorrow or something. And then I have all parts complete and can start uh, soldering uh, the first board. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm next going to do. Yep, excellent. Excellent. And then you can test it with your new Z exit. Uh, by the way, on, on how many printers are you printing at the same time? At Just. The just now I'm doing just one of the D3Ds, so that's why I need to oh. build more of them. I've, I've printed parts for like three or four more of them already, so I got to just build those out uh, and then have the oh. army going so that it's either four days for the CNC torch table with one printer or one day with four printers. So, yeah, that's, that's really good. Um, yeah, we definitely need more printers. And are you printing them in PLA or in ABS? PLA. And uh, at which density or infill? Right now I'm doing 20% for the okay. for that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we'll see if for the CNC torch table, it might need to go more than 20% if the part is not strong enough. But, I mean, it's pretty strong, but the big rods, I mean, they, they weigh a lot. So we'll see how that goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That sounds good. Yeah, so moving right along in that, I can, you know, as soon as I, I really got to get into the shop here and uh, just build out the rest of the 3D printer. So it would be probably like a one or two day job. I've got all the parts pretty much here. So we want to do that. And we really got to get this event on the counter. I'm thinking like uh, now that I've got, a, yeah, I've got one really reliable printer. Uh, I want to get the army of four or so or six to start yeah. with. And uh, it looks like the event itself, if we hold one here, I mean, we kind of have to push it back to like late July. I mean, we're already at, I mean, late June. So realistically speaking, it's like early, early August or bust <laughs> or the event is not happening because uh, late August, we have the build of this, of the, um, the brick press. So that's going to be a big event. It's going to require some, some preparation. So basically get the CNC torch table going. Um, print those parts for that but it's interesting to see how we're you know kind of like building up the infrastructure from 3d printing then to cnc torching uh, it's an interesting exercise but i'm committed to not using the other 3d printers right now i want to see that we can do it all with um, our new printers because it's a good way to test them and be committed to making sure they're really good yeah okay um that's great great work um let's move on Thanks. to Yes, thank you, uh, Joseph. So Joseph's working on the orientation video. He says it's um, would not be searchable on YouTube. Yeah, let's see. So we've got a new intro video. Um, do we want to look at that right now, Joseph? Oh, yeah, look at that. Let's entertain ourselves for two minutes here with the, the new welcome orientation video by Joseph Mickler.
Let's see if we can play this. Welcome to the OSC developer team. Look at him. We're gonna walk you through to-do list below and get you set up. First, get connected. <laughs> now, if you go over to the OSC developers page, you can check out your new teammate. Love it. If you have a smartphone, go get WhatsApp and Signal. These are the two messaging platforms we use a lot. Add your info on the OSC developers contact info page, and you can get your teammates contact info there as well. If you're on Facebook, feel free to join the Open Source Ecology Workshops group or follow Open Source Ecology, where OSC makes most of its public announcements. Go to the OSC network and join it. Also check out the featured groups and join the D3D group. Second, let's look at calendar and reminder items. It's not a bad idea to check out your end date in the welcome email and to put that in your calendar. Now go ahead and add a reminder for our weekly meeting time. That is Tuesday, 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Also, add a reminder to submit your timesheet on Mondays. Third, let's make sure you're good to go on the OSC Wiki. Now let's talk work logs. Let's make sure that your work log is set up. Go ahead and take a look at the sample log to see how they're formatted. You'll notice the general rules are that they publish early and often, post new entries on top, include links and files even if not finished, and keep posts short like post-it notes on progress. Now, the last thing for you to do with the wiki is to go to the OSC developers page and add your bio with all the other team members. Fourth, let's take a look at OSC's development tools. Go ahead and familiarize yourself with the tools we use and bookmark any help resources that you will need to refer to. As we find good sources, by the way, we start to relocate them on our 101 pages. And if you need help, just ask for it. <laughs> yeah! Hey, that's a really nice video. That's that's well done. Very clear, uh, very clear voice. Nice vi visuals. Yeah, very nice done. So, thank you. What um, What's the next step on that? Um, quick question. I just wanted to make sure, um, since it flashes to the contact info page, I didn't want to put people's um, contact information if they're not okay with that. So, um, my thought was just to leave it as an unlisted video on YouTube so it's not searchable just embedded on the site but I just wanted to make sure with that everybody was okay with that first yeah uh, I don't have a problem with that are all the developers okay with you know having their whatsapp number their phone numbers and stuff I don't let's see you know I don't think anybody's gonna call us or anything but uh, my thought was just to leave it unlisted and uh -huh. That should be okay, but I didn't want to publish anybody's information. Huh, that's that's interesting. Um, yeah, no, that's I think that's fine. So it's a it's a video that's public that's not public. It's just shared with all the new developers, right? And that and nobody else gets to see it. Is that correct? So, um, so I'm not super experienced with this, but um, uh, as I understand it, you have all these different uh, publishing options on YouTube. There's there's public where anytime anybody can search it um, then there's private where people have to be can only watch it by invite only unlisted which means anybody could see it if they have the link this specific in any searches so acted but it would just be on our site I mean somebody could share it if they wanted but I didn't think that would be an issue yeah I'm thinking, man, this video is so good. It's we want to. I would want to. <laughs> well, I, I would wouldn't mind sharing. Well, it would be interesting to have people see like what we do as when we get onboarded, like before they're even on a team. So, so it, it actually is good. I don't know. Is there is there a way w maybe we could put the contact info elsewhere? But like maybe. I mean, how else could we share that contact info? Right now, it's a. Uh, what is that a google doc file or what, what is it yeah so i mean it doesn't it doesn't have to be i can edit that out of the 
I can edit it out of the video. It's not a big deal, but I just wanted to get developers plugged in really quickly. Yeah. And if I were a developer, a new developer, I would really like to see that. So I kind of want it in the... Yeah. Well, why don't we uh, just but link... It certainly does um, question if I could blur it out, but it's also the link to that um, sheet is on the new developer page and somebody's going through it. So somebody could, even if I blur it out, somebody just go to the page and follow the link. So if we're really concerned about it, then I need to take the link out of the wiki. Because um, as it stands now, it's in the new developer orientation and in the to-do list. When somebody goes to their list, going through the steps and they go update their information. Right. Um, but where is that new developer list located? Is What format is it? Is it a Google Doc? I'll, I'll orientation. Yeah. Uh, sorry, can you say that again because you cut out? Spreadsheet. Right. So a yeah. spreadsheet. Right. So... Um, the, 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 the orientation wiki page is has two main headings. The first is from uh, general practices from the welcome email. Just a big list, a big to-do list of all the things they need to do um, just so that it can be public. Because when I started to join, I noticed that there were a lot of different instructions from people and different sources to consolidate them in one place. Um, so in the to-do list on the new orientation page in, in the get connected heading as go add your contact in from there. So even if I blurred it in the video, left it on the wiki page, somebody could still go find that page and get it. Right. I don't personally mind having my contact information up, but I didn't want to, yeah. I don't want to push that on anybody else. If they're not cool with that. Well, uh, the simple thing to do there is just to make that a private document shared only to the developers. Um, we could just make that a link in like the welcome email and yeah. just take it out of that and I can edit it out of the video. Is that best? Right, but, but I'm saying like if you just put a link, so what's what's the link that you would put into the video? The... Um, if if developers aren't comfortable with that actually being accessible by the public, we could just add that you know, in the welcome email, or you know, just HR could just send it out, and I can take it off of the orientation page, and I can edit it out of the video. It's not a not a big deal. Whatever whatever's best for everybody. Yeah, but can't we just link to the contacts doc, but doc is private, except for it's just shared with the developers, right? Can we just do that? We could, we could do that. I think that would be the best, cause, cause yeah, um, yeah, I think I think for privacy reasons, like I, I, I don't, you know, actually, uh, so so here's the deal. I actually my bank, the OSC bank account got hacked, like. This happened last week. I had to spend a day fixing it. Some people were drawing money out of it. So that kind of got me a little scared about, you know, where all my information is. Like, how, how the hell did that happen? Um, but anyway, we're fixing that. But, no, I think just, just the general procedure there, like, I do think it's a good idea to keep that kind of info private, like the phones and emails and stuff because then you know you know marketers could pick it up and start spamming you and stuff like that i think the simple solution there is just to yeah do all the links to the docs but that doc is simply shared only with the developers so someone just has to go in there and put in just the developers names and close to everybody else and i think that will that would do it yeah does that sound question like... as as it is a video you yeah. can you can kind of see the numbers but you can't actually oh. see the names oh, okay um as like now so is right, that okay right. or should i go back and edit yeah. it out it's, it's really not a big deal yeah yeah no i think just edit but it out whatever. and just fake it yeah fake it or edit it out yeah yeah it's probably it's probably good because i i do remember i i got an email from someone i like inadvertently i i uh in one of these videos 
I had a screenshot of some contact list and someone emailed me that, hey, you violated my privacy kind of deal. Um, and I know this is for the developers, but yeah, I think, I think um, yeah, let's, let's be cautious about that and just edit it out or fake it or just do something there. Yeah? So a uh, quick question, if I'm, if I'm still on sort of onboarding thing, the next, yeah. um, the next things to tidy up would be, um, I think the wiki 101 page just to get everybody uh, kind of doing the yeah. same thing with their logs and, um, just doing yeah. some weeks. Cool. Yeah, that would be. I think that would be useful for a lot of people because it's something that um, I know everyone who's new to the wiki always has questions about. Yep, I think that would, that would be useful. Yeah, I mean this video that you did, that's really it's really nice. So you, you're thinking about a, another video or just uh, instructionals? Um, so right now the, the wiki 101 page is basically a job drawer with the links um, and and Dixon started to get it set up as an actual instructional yeah um, was, was to actually assimilate a lot of the links and not just make it a repository and open up a bunch of pages and just get that tidied up so basically there's some help links in the orientation that are up somebody to a experience yeah uh, you cut out there at the end but but what I'd say is yeah that that is worthwhile because uh, the wiki needs to have some maintenance <laughs> it's got a uh, ten a decade um, maintenance backlog so yes that would be good <laughs> uh, I think we should do that mm-hmm so let's let's do that. Uh, definitely, that that's worthwhile. I think that's time well spent. Yep. Okay. And Will says he would like to help cleaning up the wiki. Um, I mean, yeah. There's the the thing about the wiki is we have to be careful about that because yeah, there's definitely work to be done. But um, we want to be clear about how you know what exactly we want to do, just small tasks at a time. Um, but yeah, that's good. Uh, and also, Will said uh, annotation. So in a video annotation, make sure we have all the links to the pages mentioned naturally, right? That's that probably makes sense. Yep. Um, excellent, excellent. So that that covers that. Keep going. Great job. And then let's just do one more thing here. Uh, so Christian is our new member here. So Christian Rupp from Germany. Uh, we're talking about. Um, creating a print server, a 3D printer farm. So we're going to get Christian on that project. We're, we probably will use a Raspberry Pi or some small microcomputer, microcontroller, uh, microcomputer that will control the army of the 3D printers that we're building up. So I'm going to follow up, Christian, we'll, we'll follow up. Uh, uh, we should meet like... Uh, maybe tomorrow or something get you going on that on exactly what that would look like so I'll follow up with an email on that um, and then last uh, let's look at the the role allocation of, of the kind of things we want to do but one big thing at this junction of the game as the 3d printer is being perfected we're getting ready for the next workshop um, can we somehow swarm up on the filament maker for anyone who is available to do that? So, um, Oliver is taken up on the height controller. That's definitely worthwhile. Abe Dixon and Cassie were working on it. Jose's still doing a website. But um, I think we're pretty much good to go on a CNC circuit mail. I'd like to see if I could start moving people over. A uh, person like Will. Um, move move them over to the extruder possibly IO uh, we're ready to print the frames so I think maybe I don't know if we can do have you move over there but 
um, then who else? Cedric is working on doing some instructionals on the computer-aided, uh, the finite element analysis, com computer-aided analysis of structure within FreeCAD. So I think we're going to do keep them there. So I think we'll open up FEA, finite element analysis, in FreeCAD. Uh, Israel is working on a CNC torch table structure, but what we have right there is almost good enough and it's really about prototyping it in real life. I mean the simple thing that we already have um, Israel that you have done once you see this this video. Israel are you on here? No you're you're not. But I was wondering if maybe we could migrate everybody available over to the extruder because there's a number of I mean the extruder allows us to make our own filament and we're kinda slowly but surely moving forward on that but let's see what we can do uh, on that let's see Roberto also uh, possibly have you move over um, so there's torch table here that was Israel so Roberto um, let's see if we can migrate possibly even Israel because the torch table, the way it is right now, it might be sufficient. Um, but as far as the the work on the swarming on a filament maker, so what have we done so far? The documents, okay, so Lyman Filament Extruder, that's the, uh, Lyman Filament Extruder is the page on the wiki, so let's, let's dive into that because I think we can use some extra energy on that. Uh, so there's a link to the Lyman Filament Extruder, you can take a look at that. Uh, so I'm pasting a link right into that document. Uh, what we've done so far is uh, some nice working documents and, and bills of materials where we're really breaking the thing down very explicitly into individual parts, pretty much deciphering the instructionals that already exist and which are not exactly clear or accurate in places. So we created a bunch of master in indices of parts as well as kind of these diagrams and these working documents of how the thing works and its, its parts. So we kind of broke it down into different modules and we were working that, uh, working in these documents as far as how to build them. So a lot of labels, a lot of part links and so forth, trying to break down the whole thing into a, an overall uh, understanding of the overall design. So as you see here, this is like well annotated. Now, kind of like re re we really went through the documentation to see exactly what's to be done. Okay, so we have those working documents on the Lyman filament extruder page um, so we can take a look at that but the idea is so we kind of have the visual bill of materials pretty much okay uh, so the next I mean we're really at the step of generating the full CAD like Dixon was saying we've identified the, the critical elements uh, of the 3d print files that are necessary and we have to pull together the other materials from different suppliers or just draw them up reverse engineer them or just simply like create put them into FreeCAD um, so that's the that's the big one right now generating a big full FreeCAD file for the the filament maker because from that file we can do many things we can do our language agnostic instructionals fabrication drawings a full bill of materials like the final one not the one that's in the current documentation but the revised one the edited one where we get very specific because sometimes um, the instructions were not clear on what to do that it left you with options so here we're gonna just straighten it out and decide on part sources and very explicit way to execute that um, so after that we do the careful step-by-step -step instructions you got a tool list pre-cutting list 3D printing list and then assembly instructions so that's that's what it takes to do this but at this point we're at the full CAD and we have broken down the thing into uh, what I would suggest is we go into this document here and on page slide number uh, breakdown slide we get into that document so let's actually go into that document and and assign that to people if, if you are willing to do that so so the new people um, the people who I just threw into the extruder. So we got Roberto, Israel, Io, and Will. 
Can you guys take on some of that work? Does that sound interesting, or or do you guys still uh, have some leftover work from before? Uh, can you give me some feedback if you'd be okay with that? So Will sounds good. Um, okay, so definitely fab drawing to me to you. Yeah, we need the um, yes. Uh, that's good. Uh, so the first step is, is generating the CAD. So what we should do, together with Dixon and Abe, so I don't know if Abe's going to show up, um, but let's start organizing around the Lyman film and texture. So page two, if you go to page two of that document, let's see, and that should be shared to the world. Um, in one of the previous meetings, let's see, I'm just loading up the sharing settings and make sure it's open for the world to edit that and once again we're okay to open up the permissions on these documents because they do have a file her history where you can simply restore to a to an old file if there's mistakes or deliberate hacking of the document itself so the general practice here is make the sharing settings open to edit which I violated for this document here <laughs> for my working document but in general let's let's keep that so anyone can find and edit okay so if you go to page two in that document uh, for the the new people that were assigned except for Christian which we're gonna assign you so so just to uh, do the print cluster here uh, I'm gonna put Christian on the on the print cluster since we talked about that a little bit um, so Christian is gonna be there okay okay so so basically the idea there is on this systems breakdown here to get the full detailed CAD file just like we did for D3D people we did a complete full CAD drawing for the 3D printer now it's time for this extruder and we've got uh, since Dixon's latest discovery on which are the correct parts we're pretty good to go so who wants to j claim one of these modules we've got six of them uh, seven altogether. So we got extruder electronics, the big box en enclosure and hopper. We got this spooler electronics and PCB, the tensioning mechanism, and then continuing the spooling mechanism. So basically, you're extruding filament here with the big box ex enclosure and hopper and extruder. Well, the extruder barrel is right here. There's an auger inside the big box enclosure. And you're extruding filament out of the after heating with the thermal components of the filament extruder. So you've got electronics controlling all of that. And electronics are pretty simple. It's pretty much on and off sensors. And what you have, you have the first step is the extrusion. The second step is um, tensioning that a little bit, like finding the tension and then spooling it up. So there's a tensioning mechanism and then a spooling mechanism where... Uh, you have to have a constant pull on the on the hot hot filament that's coming out, uh, and and it, this this works well for Lyman, uh, Mr. Lyman. He says he's uh, he's getting like plus minus 0 0.05 millimeter accuracy in an actual ABS filament that he's making. So that's pretty good. That's more than good enough for <clears throat> what we want to do for say three millimeter or 1.75 millimeter filament um, but what we want to do here is uh, have a flurry of just about all of us <clears throat> that can <clears throat> start putting this into into viable CAD models and once again <clears throat> do it where we have <clears throat> upload you can upload like the full files but then at the end of the day we want to organize just like with the file simplification where we're taking the file and stripping it down to the very basics um, of structure like for example the whatever the STL files are, we can draw them up within FreeCAD and make them much less memory uh, when it's native in FreeCAD. So for everything, 
always shoot for the sub 100 and typically like at best like 10 or 20k for each each part file because there's so many of them all right so if we're on a systems module breakdown here um, what is our role division can we start putting names like Dixon for example um, since you've been on this already which part would you like to claim as in drawing up the com and this means the complete CAD file like all the details are there so at the end of the day we can take that file and make like one one cool thing we can do is simply use the fabrication drawing module the annotated or the simple fabrication drawing or uh, dimension drawing module and put the instructions in there like okay here because you, you can annotate that and label it so one way to do it is from the CAD, full CAD file one way to do instructionals is through the fab drawings so that could be a very effective workflow instead of doing like I mean language agnostic instructions would be kind of the king of everything they're the most clear simple most art artistic and graphic but short of that we should also have the technical drawings because some people are just going to look at technical drawings like fabricators they like technical drawings they might not care so much about um the language agnostic instructionals which typically assume you've got all the parts fabricated so there's different purposes for the different steps of the uh the different assets that we generate okay but with that said let's let's get some names here uh so we've got I'm going to start, I'm going to copy and paste. Uh, so we've got all the names there. Uh, please, everybody, go into the systems module breakdown. Okay, there, there it is. Uh, I pasted all the names. Uh, please drag your name to what you would like to claim. Um, so I'll get the extruder barrel, auger, and flange. Um, but first, I'm going to um, reorganize the part library and get all those extra parts in there so it's a little cleaner. That'll okay. My task. Okay. That sounds like a good idea. So basically, I mean, um, yeah, 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 sure. You, uh, so, so basically break it down so that the parts which we want to use are very clear. Okay. And um, Dixon, in order to guide the people who are going to be doing on this, how do we most clearly explain to everyone where all the parts are? Have we actually generated any CAD files at this point, or that's not that hasn't happened yet? Like outside of the SDLs, do we have uh, any? Cassie said that she had put together some uh, at, at least one placeholder for one of the non-printed parts. I don't think any, I haven't traced any of the printed parts and I don't think anyone else has gotten to that. So, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I haven't, I haven't been in close enough contact with her to, to know exactly what she got to that done. Right. So whatever work is being started. Yeah, but starting with the printed files, there should be no conflict. Yeah, yeah. There's no, no question about the printed files. But what we try to do, uh, just to explain how the Lyman Filament Extruder page is structured on the wiki. So Lyman Filament Extruder you've got two sections one is the BOM and the second one is the master index the mass the BOM should just be like identification of the parts right like as we're gonna buy them BOM for bill of materials the master index is where we're trying to index the actual CAD files um, right so here we've got say the BOM file it's just got the li the, the different purchasing venues like uh, eBay whatever the the sources are no part links like links to the actual CAD files so it's more like but now we go to the master index and you see there's a column with the CAD file link so that's where we actually start now look at that so that is we do have a number of CAD files already 
so like for example this controller so you can take a look at it so whatever you're you're working on check in the master index whether there's a file corresponding to that part so let's take a look at that first part and what that is about what that's about well no that's just a placeholder so there's nothing there um, so there are links to I guess they're all placeholders with no substance underneath them right so Abe might have taken those from the entries I made on the part library and just used the same names yes yes so um, yeah and as far as name convention we did want to name things as clearly as possible can you can you explain the latest on that Dixon how we um, can you repeat um, so if you go to the go ahead yeah sure if you go to the filament extruder part library let me go quick um, it's kind of messy at the moment because I'm in the middle of reorganizing it but if you look at all the entries so if we go down to parts gallery and look under extruder electronics the first part is LFX which is the machine prefix for Lyman filament extruder um, computer power cord the probably not the most important particularly with CAD but you can see that the display name is that, that there's already a link to a CAD file so if you are the person who may or you know if you're doing this 24 volt power supply that's next to it if you make the placeholder for that when you upload that file to the wiki if you use this naming convention as soon as you upload it this will automatically populate and same for the image you can see that there's no image for it so when you upload the image if you just copy lfx 24 v power supply jpg and upload that it'll automatically populate so this um and i, th I think these are the same names that are on that on the index so that this should be where you get your naming convention from is the part library is probably the easiest place to go to get it yeah does that cover everything yeah so just just to kind of um yeah there is a convention like when we name a part like for example we have lfs for lyman filament spooler um what else are we seeing we've got lfx so lyman filament extruder yeah, there's only two LFX and LFS. So do we want to, like, maybe... Did we declare a number of those uh, abbreviations last time? Or no? Sorry, you're breaking up. I'm not sure what you just Yeah, said. no. Uh, do we have a list of those, how we should abbreviate those uh, part names elsewhere? Like, we've got LFX and LFS... Machines other than this extruder, you mean for just no, no, general no, just just for this, machine. like, like, yeah, it's. I think that one of the hardest things here is to keep track of all the names because there's going to be a bunch of different names, and we wanted to use some kind of a decent conver conve convention for those parts. So maybe um, in this document here, the Lyman filament extruder role allocation, the modules breakdown. Uh, let's actually do that three letter code to prefix before a part name maybe if we could do that so for example Lyman filament extruder like it would be LFX um, Lyman filament electronics I mean does it make sense the question is um, to decide now because because once once we decide on the names we'll be stuck with them uh so maybe do i mean is it worthwhile to do like outside of the parts that are already indexed for the ones that aren't uh how do we go about that name the naming convention because there's going to be a lot of parts that we're going to be playing with right um so if, if you mean what's up there, are you, are you talking to renaming the printed parts with the prefixes? No, I think, and... no, I think everything else, because like for the printed parts, we already have, like, they're already named there, so we can continue 
with with what we have already, right? Right. Right. Um, or do we just keep it I simple and just? I think ahead. our motivation for the prefix was to differentiate between M4 nuts for this and M4 nuts for something else. Uh huh. Um, the, I guess I just realized that it'd probably be helpful to have the length. So let's. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, one way to do it is, um, just go with it. Just, just, you know, when you have a part, you know, when you put a part on a wiki, just try to make it descriptive. Like, like whenever you're, you're uh, creating a part, just, I think the only guideline is try to make it as descriptive as you can. Uh, can we just settle for that? Yeah. 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 Cause yeah, since I, I, I think the, the only real specific thing is for things that could appear in in multiple projects is to use a prefix like we're using on yeah so the printed parts aren't going to be used in any other project ever because they're specific um right. whereas other like motors or power supplies uh the prefix might be helpful in sorting when you're searching the wiki so be descriptive but use a prefix on duplicable parts parts that might be used in other projects maybe yeah yeah, but then the the thing is, um, you have to have a key for that index to know what that's about. So maybe it's just better to do to be as descriptive as possible. Maybe just yeah, keep true. it. Yeah, let, let's not complicate this. I mean, it, it'll be basically uh, there's going to be a lot of different files for all the different parts, but as long as there's not a conflict with a file name on the wiki, we're okay. So so the only thing is basically whoever is working on this. As soon as you start on a file, upload it to the wiki so it has a placeholder. Like for example, um, long nut, you know, long bolt. Dot fcstd. Well, if you use that, then nobody else can use that name because it's already taken. So as long as you follow that, you're never gonna get into a file naming conflict. That's, I mean, that's the only thing to watch out for. But as long as you're uploading things to the wiki, you don't get into conflicts because if something's already taken, you can't use that name. Uh, so I think that's the only only thing we just have to stipulate. And uh, once again, that's one of the reasons why we publish early and often is so that everyone knows, you know, it's it's transparent what's up there. Like everything that's already been done has already got a placeholder for it in some way. So yeah, let's just do that. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so let's see, we've got Ayo, how about yourself? Do you wanna? Do you feel like the spool mechanism? There's a lot of uh, some 3D printed parts. Would you be okay with that? Sure. All right. Okay. So I think we're making some progress here, and, and we still have to allocate Israel and Cassie. For Cassie, we want to just check in. And make sure that um, so there's there's let's see so these are all so we've got these allocated so we're missing the tension mechanism and the thermal components. So, um, thermal components, yeah, Cassie and Israel, maybe if you can break this down. I'm gonna put you tentatively, Israel for thermal components, Cassie for tension mechanism. But basically it's like, what do you do? How do you do this process? You look at what you're working yeah, with, okay. so, so you look at the respective module that you have and start identifying parts via the master index or the bill of materials and create a placeholder or fill in the placeholder for that part so let's let's do a a brief uh, step by step procedure on this we can communicate here so 
Uh, let's and let's try to be as specific as we can on this. So. Step number one, look at the module. Identify any single part, anything that you would, that would be like a single component, like, like a, like, a, like the motor would be one component. Like, for example, you don't have to break the motor down into components because you buy a motor, but you would have to break down, for example, like if you have a coupler to that motor, things like that. So look at the module, identify any single part, um, go into FreeCAD, and then either download that part, download that part from the internet and, and uh, convert it into a FreeCAD file. FreeCAD format. So for example, you could have like STLs or STEP. If you get those, import them, and then I think the only thing you can do is pretty much save it. Like if you can import a STEP, that's already a solid file. You can you can save as so for STEP, save as FreeCAD. But for the SDL, there's the only thing you can do is really redraw it. Like you kind of have to redraw it because SDLs take a lot of memory. So you can, for example, start by downloading the SDL. Like say you find, well, well, we already have those SDLs. Right now, the step for the SDLs is to simplify them by redrawing them within FreeCAD. Um, okay, but th then the question is, where do you put them so every so you know where? Where everything is. So you, you're going into FreeCAD. You're you're save. So then save the FreeCAD files on your log. So first of all, go to your log and make sure you save it there. Then uh, put a link to your file in the master index. Right. So we had the Lyman Film and Extruder page. And we have the master index, there's the spooler index, and there's the extruder index. So we've got two main indices, one for the extruder, one for the spooler. So um, if you identify which part, yeah, so there's spooler, so it's already break, broken down nicely. Like you got the electronics, you got the tension mechanism, you've got the spool mechanism itself. So there's three modules right there, and then there's going to be a... When you look up there, CAD file link. So that's this is the column you want to populate. So you say you draw a part, then you're going to populate this table with those parts. So then it's well organized. We can at the end of the day take all the parts and assemble them into the final module. So so let's go back to this document. Put a link to, to your file in a master index that should be self-explanatory, and then do so. Do that for every file for every item, for every single part. Okay? And once you've done that for every single part, then create the module, like the overall module, like the tension mechanism module here. Create the module, and that process is specific. You do the merge function within FreeCAD. So from each file, um, Starting from each file, merge them into a final assembly. So that's the proper workflow. You, you take, you created all your individual files, and then you have simplified them. So maybe I should re-emphasize the idea of simplifying them. So put a link to your file in a master index, but then also if the file is large, or if it can use some simplification, simplify it. So, but the workflow there is simplify it, simply upload the new version over the existing file. So you start with whatever you have, say you downloaded a step, uh, save it as FreeCAD, then you might have taken a step to simplify it using the file simplification procedure that we've talked about before. So um, I, I believe there's a, a, a C file simplification protocol. That was the other document we were learning about before. Um, 
uh, let's see, um, if I go to my log, there was a file, the, the document on file simplification that everyone needs to be aware of. So file simplification, yep, there's a file simplification document on the file simplification page on the wiki. And that document walks you through how you simplify uh, parts. Now that that file simplification process talked about when we go from assemblies that we already had and we extracted simplified files from that. Here we're kind of doing it a little different in that we are starting from individual parts. Uh, but look at that document to see what of that process can be useful to you in this, in this case. Um, but basically it's, yeah, stripping all the details outside of the important details. Idea is represent something with as little memory as possible. Okay, so that file simplification document, I'm going to put a link to that right there <clears throat> so you can refer to that. Simpli so simplify the part and we're going to like 10 to 50k like 10 like 10 20k for a single part is like the ideal and, and most parts can be that like the motor can simply be like if, you know if you as an example um in my development team document to for today when we had the like for example in a cnc circuit mill here when I drew the, for example, the motor, I just did one cylinder and then another cylinder to represent the, the, the shaft and another tiny cylinder to represent the actual bit that's in the motor, in a, in a spindle motor. So just simplified, forget it, you don't need to worry that there's these five bolt holes there or there's that ring there or whatever else. Just get the underlying shape to get the, um, the main structure. Okay. So do that for every single part. Then you're creating the entire module. So you're you're loading parts using the merge. And under the file menu within FreeCAD, you go to merge, not import, but merge. That's that's the important part. The so create the entire module. Um, and from then we're golden, and we can do all kinds of fabrication drawings, step by step procedures. Because if once we have the whole CAD file, we can actually communicate with it and and think about how it goes together. Uh, so combined with the build instructions and the overall CAD file, we should be able to then swarm on doing a detailed build procedure, basically refining the steps that are already in the in the manual. And as you see, Dixon got tricked into what you know what files were really needed. It wasn't clear like what was what. So now we're really simplifying and making it work. So um, is that is that sufficient for now? And what questions do we have on, on this overall process? So the goal is create full CAD. So after everybody, all of us have the individual modules drawn up, then, then a master file can be drawn up that has, uh, that's the overall spooler with everything. Um, and at that point, it's extremely important that we keep the file size small because it will become a very large file. All right. Um, Abe, anything to pipe in on this here? Oh, yeah, Abe, you got, you got run out of town here. We don't have you on, <laughs> under any any tasks here but uh abe what, what would you like to do or maybe you can uh, see that would be a case to pair up with somebody but um abe what are your thoughts on that any thoughts abe do you want to you want to pipe in on any of the on this work here hello hello abe you're kind of breaking up there Okay. No, I, I asked, um, we basically doled out, we swarmed, we had a lot of more people, we added more people to the filament extruder part. So we basically said, okay, our next step is CAD and put everything into the master index, all the CAD files once we generate them. But on the Lyman filament extruder page there, uh, with the work breakdown, the modules breakdown, 
uh, can you take on one of the roles or maybe help guide the people who are in one of the teams to actually get them started or maybe possibly you could be like maybe check in with everybody and see if they're they know what to do uh, I don't know but how can you uh, collaborate given that you kind of know you're a little more oriented on an yeah. extruder uh, tell me what you think yeah so I think that so far um, got pretty much everything else well files are pretty much set up now, including the indexes. They're still missing a bunch of stuff, but that's mostly stuff that we just haven't made yet. So I think the CAD is definitely the priority, so it's good to see we've got uh, people to help with that. I think we can get through uh, just kind of roughing most of the parts and CAD pretty quick. There's a lot of parts and certain materials, and I know that the Wiki 2 is not an immediate priority, but there's some things that are just materials that are used to make it that don't necessarily belong. Uh, tape and just odds and ends. Obviously, some of those items we don't need to generate uh, CAD files from, I don't think. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some sheet materials, too. There could be a little bit of confusion about uh, some of the like, DIY parts where he's setting up some of those, because they're listed in the wiki, and I think everybody's been going by uh, the current list bombs and all this is just copied in so there's some some things listed in the wiki i noticed that uh could be removed because we probably don't need any cad files for those tape and, and other parts there's the parts that are hard to generate cad files too like the stuff that's uh, more flexible i guess we can just kind of generalize those so like wires Wire and or like the cloth, uh, the welding blanket, uh, some of the tape things. I mean, we can kind of just make that look awesome, yeah. that I guess, in CAD. Yeah, yeah, just, uh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, so maybe what you can do is... Um, you want to jump in with like Israel maybe on the thermal components or maybe Israel and and, and Cassie or would you be able to kind of like check in with people and maybe communicate with them on on whether they're making progress maybe like follow up with everybody who's got parts doled out to make sure that they get started because I think the the first thing is like to get the best way to get started is start the first file you know put it on your log and then start collecting the files so that the momentum builds up. But just just get started on it and, and get going because be, I think it might be a little confusing. But once you start going at it, you'll see that, okay, now I'm making up part by part, figuring it out. Uh, but I think some guidance, we could have some guidance, uh, a little more guidance to the people that are uh, doing the work. Um, I mean, one one good thing to do would be to take for every module if we are i mean we do have a lot of those those diagrams within the working document right here so people should take a look at them and and maybe like make their own or like adopt their own working document so they make sure that they have um all the parts accounted for so so probably whoever is working on on these should take the corresponding part within the corresponding page from the working doc and kind of keep track of where they are so they check off all the parts uh, that are needed like uh, maybe maybe the formal procedure should be um, yeah okay so there's a slide so let's do actually see because the accounting process to make sure that we're complete and we have everything um, that's needed uh, that's that's an important part so I'm gonna actually make a few more notes about that what I would suggest is just like in a file simplification procedure document, I would suggest that um, we do the the bubbles, like the numbered bubbles. Uh, so take 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 your picture, your module picture, and I would say just simply just arrow and number arrow plus number to so that you cover 
all the parts and make sure you don't miss anything and you keep track it so you go 1 through X 1 through 20 1 through 30 um, but for some people it might be like a little challenging to find out what all the parts are so maybe like I don't know I was thinking maybe Abe if you could maybe help in the part of okay here's this module picture and then 1 through 20 like if maybe maybe you'd be the best person to identify every single part or I mean we have that somewhat in a in a working document but sorry in the master index right but there might be multiples of parts or some other things where um, we should identify make sure we have everything I don't know uh, how does that sound Abe does that make any sense or is that not making sense just trying to make sure that the counting yeah. process uh, is complete yeah go ahead It does, and a bit more. right, because because I mean we already have a lot of doc the documentation on okay breaking things down into parts with some of these arrows like here, like all these all these pages, um, but I guess the value that we can add to that is is um, just simple numbers like, and let's well, let's see let's see if we can maybe try that process. So, for example, we've got the extruder electronics. Oh wait, A B already. Okay, okay, I've, okay. A B already have that. Okay, so so let's take the extruder electronics as an example. So say we've got this, just to kind of show you what this process looks like. So take that and um, represent it. So now put arrows to every single thing. So obviously you've got the power supply. Um, and you can put, you know, say take one, you know, one power supply. Um, and kind of go through the detail of this. But but let's do this. Like, everybody, if you can jump into that, just start labeling in one through 20 or something. Um, okay, that's one thing I noticed. Uh, um, some of the sheets and, and numbers, there's lots of uh, part numbers. On things, and of course, we've got part numbers from Lyman, and then we're trying to do part numbers in the spreadsheets. And I'm not sure that everything is actually consistent yet. Right. So I noticed there were different parts from Lyman onto the wiki and the part library as well. So um, and that's one thing we need to get straight is keeping the part numbers the same. Uh, not sure if we should. I expect the user to go off the spreadsheets. Um, Maybe the index for the original. Well, I, I don't think the, the original bombs are kind of confusing. So we kind of need our own uh, yeah. static that we go from the, the standard. Yeah. I mean, what if... Um, I mean, what if every person just maybe started their own spreadsheet? Would that confuse things or would that help? So a spreadsheet and just, you know, 1 through 20. Here's the parts that I have, that I know I have, you know. And and list them, like, very explicitly, like, like down to the very detail. What do you think? Yeah. Um, that, that could work. There's not that many parts in some ways. For I think there's only, like, um, oh, there's maybe, I don't think there's 40 parts in the... Um, in the extruder and the spooler, I think there's even less. Uh huh. Or 30 or something. So, yeah, if everybody ends up with. And so, some of those, I think, breakdowns have more parts than others, but if people end up with, um, you know, a dozen or so parts each, uh, that, that could work out. Um, and that creates more. 
spreadsheets for each country. Everybody gets all yeah. Um, I, they should they should be able to edit the documents, the existing documents. Um, I mean, they're collaborative documents, so. Right. Like um, between the bomb and the index, I would think we'd have enough. I tried to leave enough room in the, the index and stuff for notes. If we need to add like more note columns or different columns in there that, that could help for more description. Right. And, you know, okay, so look at what I, um, let's see, are you seeing my screen? Yeah, look at my screen, what I'm doing right there. Like, for example, going through this um, right there, this exercise right here. So I'm putting arrows to all the parts that I can see are distinct entities but have we verified um sorry sh um yeah hold on i'm i'm getting a call um have we verified that the like every like for example in a diagram every single part is critical or are there like things that okay the instructions turns out they're just not used or something like what I'm doing right now, like I'm up, you know, part the, seven there. Did you hear that? Everything. Yeah. If everything in the most of the photos, although not all those photos that are copied from Mr. Lyman's PDFs are some of them do have pictures that are of older items. So not everything in all the photos is necessary. But in that, that all I think stuff that we want in or options that we want in okay um, right so so do you think it's reasonable to have everybody um, just maybe at a first like how about we do this what at, what if at the first stab you take your picture and just draw all those all those arrows number them and kind of uh, try to identify them as closely as possible like at best a link to the actual part like uh, either well you'd have to end up like we could do the visual index where where this breakdown you actually link link your uh, cat eventual cat file to this uh, to each number here you know like like for example, if it's if it's this wire, well, that could be probably a sourcing link because I don't know if we're going to draw wires in the CAD, but that could be, for example, a sourcing link. Whereas you know, like say this this electronic component right there, you actually have a drawing within FreeCAD, so you'd link to the FreeCAD drawing, perhaps. Um, For me, it would be most easy to have a link to 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 um, basically put a CAD file link. You, you eventually have to generate a CAD file, so you can so maybe that like all these numbers should be linked directly to the CAD file. So it'd be your visual index. How about that? Uh, would that work? I'm just trying to organize it so that you know, for one, yeah, you, you can take a, a visual yeah. index would help. Yeah. So eight would be three D printed piece. Yeah. So so let's suggest this to everyone. So take your module picture, arrow and number, so you cover all the parts, keep everyone on track, and then for every part, you need a CAD file. I mean, accept wires. I mean, wires are kind of hard, and so maybe accept wires. Um, which should have you should still label them let's say which should have uh link to p ordering part link to part ordering so for example like if i'm seeing all these wires i mean it could be useful for the sake of the final procedure like i mean it it would be good to actually label every single wire like that's an entity we have to make sure we have that connection at the end of the day uh, I mean, I would label all the wires actually, like down to every single part. Like, if there's connectors, like a whatever it is, a wire nut or something else, uh, I would want to include that as well, because those are the things we're gonna have to buy. Make sure we have have in our inventory of parts. 
Um, yeah. So like, I don't know. Wires, wires are kind of tricky. It's it's hard to account for wires because they're hard to draw. But maybe you know we could what? have. Hmm. Yeah. There are some tools and maybe some instructional stuff we need to do for making the wires easy and yeah. Cat, yeah. Because if you the right tools, they wouldn't be so difficult. Yeah. They can be laid out in a non. Um, they can be laid out in a nice pattern, which yes. is ideal. You built to do that way. There's no. It, it's simpler to have the wires more neatly laid out. Yeah. Anyway, instead of just. Yeah. No, that's that's true. But we should I mean we should definitely account for the wires. So like say that label right there that's that wire that's going to be part 9. You know. Um you know what kind of wire is it because eventually you have to buy the exact thing and make sure it's the right wire and stuff. So yeah. But I would say for everybody, let's let's get everybody to do a a detailed diagram as possible and just start going through the numbers. Maybe leave the wires for last like like that's wire number nine, maybe um, number ten. We've got that wire there, this red red other one, because that will force you to actually understand where every single connection is made. And and but start with the simpler things. Like we know there's certain parts there. Um, so basically, I would say the goal for next week, if if people can get at least a few of these parts drawn up and just just uh, I would say we don't have to start up a spreadsheet if we use this as a visual linking thing so for example uh, whatever this is um, this wire is you would put on the link and you can actually declare a link right there you can say HT and you, you would go to the wiki HTTP open source ecology org slash wiki and then your file name which is the four wire dot whatever its name is, uh, .fcstd. So by doing that, you have already actually declared a placeholder on the wiki for that. So then you, when you click on it, it actually takes you to upload a file on the, right on the wiki. So that's one way to do that. Uh, takes you to this place and it says there's nothing there. Well, I did that wrong. I, the, the proper format here is uh, file colon um, so that should right file colon that would get us to an upload see it gets you to an upload so you would, you would click on upload to upload it so that's the, the way to create placeholders but that could be an effective way to do it uh, so how many um, how many parts can we get by next week we've got seven people in principle Can we get maybe 10 parts, 20 parts? Is that doable within a week? 10 parts, 5 parts. It depends how complex they are. If they're complex, but I mean things like, you know, a simple motor yeah. just like the placeholder for say this uh, you know, this this relay here. It's going to be a box, maybe draw a couple of terminals on it, it could take you half hour, you know. So yeah, they they're simple enough that, you know, cylinders and cubes, you know, better put a few holes in them or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Shapes need to be added to what the part is and that's it. That's it, that's it. So they're, they're pretty simple. Right. So half an hour per element or something like that and just save it. I mean, it could be just a simple block, but the key is the the most important part is identify that part within the bill of materials or the master index so you know its dimensions. You have to look it up somewhere. So, um, So look up parts in BOM or master index to extract the dimensions. You have to actually go to a manufacturer's site or whatever, the part ordering link, and get, they'll typically tell you the dimensions wherever that you have documentation on a part. So that's the, that's the idea. All right. So let's try this. Let's see how many parts we can get. But try to go for 10, 10 parts by next week. Can you guys do it? Simple parts. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Any other questions? Because I think this is... Uh...
complex enough. Everyone popped off though. <laughs> Other people popped off. <laughs> well, let's see. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so people should watch the remainder of this video to see what we discussed on this. But we're kind of like trying to figure out what's the most effective way. But the bottom line is simply there's parts. Let's see if we can get 10 of them for each module. So altogether, if there's seven, seven modules right there. We're talking about at least 70 parts for next week. And then maybe in two weeks, we're done with the entire CAD set. And then we can just put it all together and make it um, make a meaningful picture out of it. Uh, so that we have accounted for everything and maybe a b your role would be to ch ch kind of go through people's uh maybe verify some people's things to so if, if you see any parts that are not necessary um you can correct them so what i would suggest for everybody that that did that get a um i'm gonna put a little more detail here look at the module identify a single part go into free cat so look at the module um create a, a doc a presentation doc with all part numbers like on next page so we're expanding on this so basically take your picture and do this point to every single part label it add links to it and uh, then go about going into FreeCAD and, and creating those files, uh, post them on your log, link them. Well, so here this, this uh, we gotta change this here because we just said, save the, definitely save this on your log uh, so you can find that easily. Uh, use a um, visual index, a visual linked index file. Yeah, um, and then once you have that, like, I don't know how accurate the master index is going to be to reconcile, but maybe, you know, before, let's not confuse the master index yet, maybe. Uh, what we should do, I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to cross that out here. Um, strike through, strike that, that part. Uh, don't worry about the master index. I would say when we do the visual index on a page on our log, embedded in our log, there'll be enough. And then after we have verified that all the parts are right, before going into the final final master index, we do the full CAD and verify the CAD by getting instructionals out of that. And by that time, when we're at the end, we can put in all the different modules and parts to the final master index. Right now, we've got like a preliminary master index, which has, um, there might be some conflicts in there, but we'll have to uh, verify it later. So so for now, I would say our master organizi organizing principle is the visual index of this breakdown index uh, that everyone can do for their, their respective part. And... And clearly you can see these parts so like don't be shy just take this find out what the dimensions are um, by looking at links start drawing these up just keep doing it one by one and see where we are next week yeah I think that's that's all we can say for now any other comments yeah that's sounds okay yeah that sounds good yeah yeah let's do that um, for the part library, I think, Abe, if I could follow up with you, I'm trying to, I think I've got all the extra pieces kind of shunted to the bottom, and then I kind of want to um, get get the part library to where we're at as far as what parts go in what module, but it sounds like that's going to be developing probably over the next week. Um, but I'll follow up with you probably tomorrow on that. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, I mean, outside of cleaning up the the module, the part library, I think everyone can can start on actually generating those um, those parts. Is there going to be any conflict for what people start generating right now, like as far as the file names that they use? Because there will be confusion there. Like, uh, so if people just start adding links, and there's there like for example, the three D printed pieces are already linked in the master index. 
that would be the only point of conflict we could see but otherwise everyone should feel free to just create their file names and start them is that correct um yeah i mean we can, i can always i can always change what i've done in the part library yeah so right uh, yeah, I would say to, to prevent confusion. I, I mm. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I'm thinking, um, I, I think the general procedure should be that people should, whenever they get to a 3D printed part, they should check in on the master index. Um, but then again, if they just start the file and you already have it in indexed, uh, on the part library page, we can we can uh, basically merge those. I mean, that's called merging. So we can basically delete one and upload it over the one that's already started. So that wouldn't be much much effort. So I think I just want to make sure that people aren't blocked on not having like enough direction or clarity on where to put things. So I would say, yeah, just go right ahead, create your file name, and then. If we've got to merge any files, we will do that, but as a sub subsequent step. So we don't have to worry about that right now. Yeah, I think that's that's the way to go. Okay. We don't want to block anybody from mo moving forward. It, well, and if it's a printed part, just change the file extension, and then it, it, will, it should already conform. Yeah. Um, the real problem is that. Right. So... Um, yeah, I think we can reconcile everything later. Like right now, we get people busy, and the final cleanup will happen at a later time. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty good. Just like we kind of did with the 3D printer, kind of cleaned up some things at the end, simplified things. Yep. All right, all right. So with that said, I think that's that's uh, good enough for today. Um, thank you everybody for listening, and please review this. If you have any questions, I'll be posting that <clears throat> as soon as this is uploaded to uh, uploaded to YouTube and let everybody know. Okay, uh, and just just as a final final reminder, uh, everybody who hasn't logged their numbers, please do so. I know there's a few people that haven't logged their numbers. Uh, there's only six people that have actually logged work for for the past week, so please uh, do that if you haven't. And with that said, I think that's good enough for this week, and keep going forward. So thanks a lot, everybody, and see you next week. Once again, Tuesday, 1 p.m. CST. Bye-bye.